to you who answered the call of your country and served in its armed forces to bring about the total defeat of the enemy. I extend the heartfelt thanks of a grateful nation. As one of the nation's finest, you undertook the most severe task one can be called upon to perform. Because you demonstrated the fortitude, resourcefulness, and calm judgment necessary to carry out that task, we now look to you for leadership and example in further exalting our country in peace. My pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Behringer Crawford Museum and point out a few people responsible for this. First, um, uh, Executive Director Laurie Risch and Assistant Director Chris Myman. Uh, thank you all very much. And the committee that put this uh, series together, uh, headed by Betty Lee Nordheim. Betty Lee is the uh, head of the Exhibits Committee, and uh, they've just done a terrific job of this whole World War II exhibit plus the uh, uh, lecture series, History Unplugged. Let's thank them. And it's also my pleasure to point out that we have one of our trustees back here, uh, Joyce Coleman, actually two of our trustees, mm -hmm. Jane O.J. is here too, um, who is, uh, are going to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Joyce Coleman, Joyce, would you come on forward and uh, We'll turn this over to you. And okay, to Gary has already welcomed you, and I too welcome you on behalf of the museum. And I hope that this will not be your last time, because we're open all the time, and we allow people to come in, visitors. We encourage you to take a membership and come and be a part of all the activities we have here. And today, it's kind of a special event for us, because we've had the World War II exhibit going, and we've had various speakers come in and people have been amazed, first of all, that we're here on top of the hill, so spread the word and uh, come back again, as I said. But most importantly, we happen to have someone who actually was in World War II and survived it, the big war, as I was always taught it was called. And that's Mr. David Peters, and I forget his rank, he's retired and he'll forgive me for this. And we have the son of a Tuskegee Airman, uh, Mr. Samuel Finley. And Tuskegee Airmen, for those of you who do not know, uh, Tuskegee is in Alabama, it's South Central Alabama, it's now Tuskegee University. There was an airfield that was built there, in, they started an aeronautical program in 1939. And the airfield was built in 1940 and 1941, it was out in the middle of a cow pasture, and they said it's a good place because of the racism and the segregation that no one would have to rub arms with them and they could go there and learn. Booker T. Washington, who was a graduate of Hampton Institute, started, was one of the presidents of Tuskegee Institute. And the field there, the airfield, is named Moton Field, which is named for the second president of Tuskegee Institute at that time, which was started really as an A&M, Agriculture and Mechanical School. And they had the first aeronautical uh, or aviation training program. I was very fortunate because my uncle was one of the people, and I've been told that he too can be considered a Tuskegee Airman because he helped to build the field there. And he was at that field, at Moton Field, and he was at Maxwell Field Air Force Base in Alabama. I had another uncle who served and was discharged from Maxwell Field, both of whom served over 35 years. Back in uh, the beginning of World War, end of World War I and the beginning of World War II, there was a lot of um, sentiment and a lot of Americanism, a lot of strong feelings by African Americans for the military and a lot of respect for the country. So during World War II, there was probably the highest number of African Americans serving voluntarily in the war. And one thing I'd like to point out to you is that African Americans have served in every war that the United States has ever been engaged in, and I'm not sure right at this point, but up to the Vietnam War, an African American has won the highest medal given by our country, and that is the Medal of Honor, the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
and I don't have the name of the person for the Vietnam War, but I do have a list of them. But before I, without going on, I too could talk about Tuskegee and Tuskegee Institute because I was born in Alabama, and I've been to Tuskegee Institute, and I had an uncle who taught there, as well as my uncle who helped to build the airfield. But without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce to you, and out of respect for my elder, I'd like to introduce Mr. McPheeters first. Mr. McPheeters, welcome to Bear Thank you. Thank you for having us here. We are always happy to tell our stories. Each and every one of us who are survivors have a story to tell which is unique and it can give an education to any listener regarding what we went through as, as Americans and as black Americans. Uh, those are two different stories. Uh, I was taught as a child, my father and mother both taught me as a child that you were an American first and nobody else can take that away from you. And it's up to you to insist on being recognized of what you are and what your nationality is. I apologize, I had a, a stroke uh, in 1999 while I was having a uh, triple bypass. It was on the table. So it affected my speech, and I may not be able to deliver as well as I'd like to. So, uh, nonetheless, in getting on, uh, my background is uh, as a, a native Cincinnatian. I was born in 1922, January 7, 1922, in Cincinnati, Ohio, in Walnut Hills. And my father and mother were working people. My mother didn't work as long as my sister and I were not in high school. Before we got to high school, my mother did not work. She stayed home, made a home for myself, my, my sister, <coughs> and my father. My father was a Pullman porter, and he worked, worked for the uh, Pullman company for almost 50 years. And he also was the uh, head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters chapter in Cincinnati and uh, was a very good and close friend of A. Philip Randolph, who was the national president. Uh, I had some good upbringing. We had a family. We were kept off of the streets unless we had some place to go. And we were taught politeness. We were taught to be very, very kind to people if we expect to have kindness, kindness uh, awarded to us. Uh, those are the things that we learn very early. If I got uh, any bad uh, information sent home from school, I was in deep trouble when I got home. Mm -hmm. And there was no uh, parent of mine who went to school to find out if I was abused by a teacher, because the teacher could do no wrong as far as my family was concerned. Uh, this is the kind of background I came from as a child. When Pearl Harbor happened, I happened to be on, on my knees, and my elbow on the uh, bench, my head in the, in the radio listening to announcements uh, coming up, and suddenly the announcement came that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. It was 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. And I rushed down the stairs and told my mother. My father was on the road working someplace. I think he was had a run to Buffalo, New York at that time. Well, my mother said, well, I don't know anything about it. So I kept on and kept on. I was always curious about what was going on, what was going on in the neighborhood, what was going on in the community. We were taught that. We learned very soon that we were a part of a neighborhood and we were interested, or had to be interested, in what went on in that neighborhood. So consequently, I was very curious. I was at that time, I was 19 years old. And so consequently, 
uh, when my father came home, uh, I said, I want to go into the service to help because I know that there's going to be a draft. He says, I don't want you to go. I said, but I got to go. He says, no, you can't go. I said, why? He said, I don't want you to get hurt. I said, everybody gets hurt sometimes, Dad. He says, you don't know what I'm talking about. And then he told me his story. He said, in World War I, he volunteered to go into the army. And we, when he went down to volunteer, they told him it was a white man's war and that he wasn't needed. And he was not wanted. So he took up a job with the Pullman service and then he got drafted. And when he went to the draft board, he said, I'm in a necessary service and as far as I'm concerned, it's still a white man's war. And so he didn't go to war and he's, he held that little chestnut close to him all that time. I said, well, to myself, uh, he always told me I was hard-headed, okay. Maybe I went to the boss. I went to my mother. And I said, Mom, it's going to make a man out of me or a bum out of me. Please let me tell Dad to sign me up. In those days, you had to be 21 to get into the Army. You could be 17 and go into the Navy, but the Army meant you had to be signed over by an adult. Well, she told my dad what the law was, and he took me over here to Fort Thomas, and I signed up. I wanted to go into the Air Corps because we used to get all the black newspapers, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender, the Atlanta World. Uh, we got all those papers because that's the only way we could find out what's going on in the other uh, black neighborhoods and black parts of the United States. And so we knew what was going on. Well, I uh, went into the service thinking that I was going into the Air Corps. I took the test at Fort Thomas. For some reason, I got a very high grade on the Army General Classification Test. I don't know how it was. I happened to have been a, a freshman at UC at the time, at night. I was going to school at night at UC and working as an elevator operator at the Havilland Hotel downtown. Mm. So uh, I had a, you know, I had a work ethic uh, right away. And so uh, when I went into the service and I had this high grade, they didn't send me to the Air Corps, they sent me to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is the Field Artillery Replacement Training Center. So this is a, a long story, and I'm not going to bore you with a, 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 a whole lot of it. Uh, you already have the paper that tells you this, the Tuskegee story. It, the, it's in the it's in those papers. And please, anytime you want to ask me a question, if I can answer it, I'll tell you what. And if uh, it, if uh, Sam Philly can answer it, he he can tell you. He's he's liable to interrupt me anytime because he tells me I talk too long. Anyhow, <laughs> but anyhow. Uh, I went to Fort Sill, they put me in a, an instrument and survey battery. Uh, that meant I had to be a, a person who had a math background. Oh, forget it. I mean, I, I couldn't make that. Uh, but uh, after I, I finished there, uh, they sent me to Camp Gruber, Oklahoma to a tank destroyer battalion. And uh, during that time, uh, I asked for uh, I asked for OCS because uh, the Air Corps said that I couldn't come in unless I had an operation for umbilical hernia. So I had that corrected at Fort Sill while I was there. So when I got through the, uh, that basic training, I went to uh, uh, Camp Gruber and I put in for, the, uh, uh, for OCS and they sent me to Tank Destroyer Officer Candidate School and, and I graduated on February 11, 1943 as a second lieutenant. Uh, I still wanted to go into the Air Corps. Well, I got the chance to go to Tuskegee by taking another test in Greensboro, North Carolina after I'd gotten my commission and I passed that test and they sent me to, uh, to uh, Tuskegee. Well, being 20 years old and being a second lieutenant was a little heady for me and I wasn't a really prepared 
for that kind of authority. I thought that I was more than I was. A second lieutenant to... Well, anyhow, I showed up at Tuskegee at uh, Moton Field, where I was to meet my whoever my instructor was to be. And I went in there with the other people who went down there. I, was, I went down there with uh, uh, 17 other officers, uh, 16 second lieutenants and one first lieutenant. And we, uh, we went in and everybody showed up uh, for uh, orientation over at Moton Field in fatigues except me. I came in there with my big shiny cavalry boots and my riding crop. Well, that went over like a lead balloon with the guy who was to be my uh, instructor. And he told somebody that I was, I was his. And so, uh -oh. so anyhow, I lasted 11 hours. I had 11 hours flying training before I got washed out. And I had gone to him several, several times, but he always turned me down for any information of what he told me if I had spent a little bit of time uh, studying more than I was romancing. I happened to take up company with a girl who was a nurse over at the Veterans Hospital. And so he told me if I didn't romance so much and study a little more, I could get all the information I wanted. So that too was held against me. I wasn't prepared, really. I, I will admit, I was not prepared. And it, I, I say this to say that it took a lot of learning for me to be somebody that I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And so, consequently, it took me a long time to understand who I was and who I wasn't. And so, when I, uh, when I got uh, washed out, they sent me back to my division, the, to the 92nd Division. Uh, I was sent to the only black, all-black outfit at the 92nd Division, the, the uh, 600 Field Artillery. Uh, Colonel Ray, who was uh, from Chicago, uh, I talked to Colonel Ray. He says, well, I have to send you to Officer Special Basing Course up in Fort Sill, and uh, maybe you can get into uh, flying training up there. When I got there, they said, yes, you can get into flying training, but not as a pilot since you washed out of Tuskegee. So they gave me the aerial observer training, and I got my aerial observer wings at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. While I was at Fort, uh, Fort Sill taking that training, my division moved out to Italy. I did not get to go with it. When I finished the course at Fort Sill, they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, uh, the fact in those days they didn't know what to do with many black officers. Uh, they didn't know where to send us, who to assign us to, or whatever. And we ended up most of the time in quartermaster and, and service organizations. So I was sent from Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, Officer Special Basic Course. I was sent to Fort Benning, Georgia to Infantry Special Basic Course. Okay, so I spent three months in, in Fort Benning, and then after that, I finished the course there. They didn't know what to do with me, so they sent me back to, uh, I forgot the camp now, but the, all these crazy little camps I was in. I ended up going overseas uh, to, uh, in a signal company, uh, going to uh, the Far East. I went to, uh, the war was still going on in the Philippines and I was uh, attached on a sign to a, a, a signal company. <clears throat> well, I lasted uh, as long as the war lasted over there. I got shot at once uh, when the Japanese came in to raid our uh, food truck, uh, truck on the way down, we were on the, way, on the way down from San Fernando to Manila. Well, that was, uh, that was a tale in itself. All of these things that I'm telling you has a, has a long chapter to them if, I, yes, if you yes. wanted to l listen to it. But I sure, I'm sure not going to stand here and tell you what they are because yeah, some of them are, are crazy and some of them are just ridiculous. <laughs> so the, the, uh, I, I, I found out one thing. Uh, when, I, when I got out in 1946, 
I was uh, sent back to the United States in 1946, and at that time I decided uh, I was going to uh, uh, take up, uh, well, I didn't tell you about my Tuskegee experience, uh, is only the fact that I uh, got washed out. But while I was waiting to be assigned down there, uh, I met a fellow who was a, also a fellow Ohioan who happened to be the base photo officer. And he says, well, while you're waiting around, why don't you come down to the lab and help me out? I'll teach you all I know about uh, photography. It might do you some good someday. I said, fine. So I was always crazy about photography. So I went down and helped uh, Bob Sneed, who was the base photo officer, and he taught me all about the darkroom techniques and different things, and I got all cooked up about that. And after the war, when I got out, instead of going back to UC, I went to photo school in New York. And, uh, and at the same time, when I finished photo school, I got a job with the Pittsburgh Courier, a uh, black newspaper, and I was the Ohio, uh, the Southern Ohio, Northern Kentucky correspondent for the Pittsburgh Courier. I wrote a lot of stories, I, I, I took a lot of pictures for them. Uh, my boss was the Ohio editor stationed in Cleveland. To me, uh, I had made contacts at Tuskegee, and I want to tell you now, I made contacts at Tuskegee that I, I, would only, I don't think I was going to be able to uh, get anywhere after I got a, got a service. But the contacts that I knew down there, uh, when I got there as a second lieutenant, and with a half a year's education in college, I ran into guys who had degrees from bachelor to doctorates. And instead of pushing me away, they embraced me. They taught me. They gave me all kinds of advice and, 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 and assistance. <coughs> This was after I washed out. What they did not shun me at all. They gave me what they had. Mm -hmm. And we were just a, a little colony of, of people helping one another. Yes. And I learned a lot of things for those guys and those girls down there. They taught me. I don't know where I'd be today without what they gave to me at Tuskegee uh, when I was in flight school. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very hard for me to relate what education, that kind of education meant, what kind of contacts that meant. But I have done a lot of things in my life after that experience in World War II that have put me in very good positions. Uh, my education, I went back to school uh, after uh, I got through with this business of photography and uh, I decided, well, I'm going to go back to school anyhow. I was, uh, I was went to, went to uh, from the Army Reserve to the Air Force Reserve because I had a contact at Wright Patterson who got me into uh, to doing photography as a, for the Air Force at Wright Patterson. While I was there, they recalled me to active duty as, as an Air Force officer. And they sent me to Germany as a as a, 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 a supply officer for the 60th troop troop carrier wing, mm -hmm. and so it was over there. I stayed over there for three years, and I was told that uh, I needed more education, and uh, my promotion possibilities depended on the education that I had, and I didn't have enough to go anywhere really. Mm -hmm. So when I got back. When I, when I got back, I decided I'm going back to UC. But I had to start all over again. I took four years and three, and it almost killed me. But I got through. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after I got through with that baccalaureate course, I took up, I, I applied for uh, the doctorate program at New York University in International Relations. I got there, uh, I got within seven hours of the doctorate when I ran out of money. And I asked for a civil service to help me out. I passed a civil service exam. I went to, uh, I took a civil service exam at uh, Griffiths Air Force Base as a, a command post officer up there. Uh, there was, this was during the Cold War, and uh, we had a lot, a lot of uh, alert uh, plans that we had to initiate. And I stayed up there until uh, 
oh, a couple of years. And uh, from then on, it was a case of me going back to New York because uh, I wanted to get my degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I didn't get it because I went to work. I ran into a friend of mine who I, I knew in the service, Ray Rivera, who happened to be uh, the industrial relations officer for the New York Urban League. And he said, do you want to be a fundraiser? I said, I want to do anything that makes me some money. <laughs> so he put me, he, he introduced me to Dr. Uh, uh, Lewis, who was the uh, executive director. Dr. Lewis told me, he, uh, he saw my resume, he listened to me during an interview, and he told me, well, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll take you aboard, but you have to take this course first. And I, he put me in a course which, which was given by the United Jewish Appeal. It's a clinic, it was a clinic that I went to for fundraising. And this fundraising clinic, it was a really a, a human relations uh, job, and I spent six weeks in that clinic and I learned everything that I could learn. It was, it was, it's an art. Fundraising is an art. And it's something that you have to have a lot of patience with. You have to have a lot of outgoing with. You have to have a lot of love for your community with. You have to have a lot of understanding that the people who are uh, in power positions and people who, who make decisions around your community, they have to be contacted, you have to know them. You can't just look at them in a newspaper. You have to be able to address them and work with them because industry, uh, corporations, foundations, all of these people, whether they're corporations or, 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 or heads of, uh, of companies, these people earn their right to exercise their citizenship. And you are working with them to do that for which they are supporting you financially. Yes. Time's up. <laughs> I want to tell you, uh, I won't go into the, the rest of it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to Sam. Uh, Sam is the, uh, he's going to succeed me as president of, uh, of the Tuskegee Airmen Greater Cincinnati chapter as of uh, this coming January. Uh, he's very capable. And he's got a lot of energy, a lot more than I have. And so I think that uh, he can tell you a lot of things about uh, the organization, uh, about what Tuskegee Airmen mean. Uh, he's, uh, he retired from the Air Force as a technical sergeant. And uh, he's got a lot of respect from everybody in our chapter. And I think he's going to lead us a long way. And what we want to do is to extend the hand of friendship out to you, each and every one of you, if you need us for anything. Our, our ideas is to go into the community to help our children become good citizens and to get a better education <coughs> than we had. And with that education, they can use their Americanism to further America. Thank you. So, Sometimes I got to pull him down because he'll be going on and on, but it's all good. Um, we promote education, first of all. We have a stipend program which uh, promotes, in fact, this past year we have one young man gained a $1,500 a year, $1,500 scholarship. And we want to give all of our money away to kids, both sides of the fence, to gain education. Tuskegee Garman, back in the year 1925, our War University deemed that an American black man had a smaller brain than that of a white man, 1.8 centimeters. Therefore, they could not attain the same knowledge as a white man could back in those days. During that Industrial Revolution time, they would say, well, we got to be porters, serve something, carry something, or war something, but we could not go into combat at all. But a group of young men from four universities at the time, Hampton Institute, Morgan State and Howard University said, no, we're not going to have this. In fact, one of the gentlemen sued the United States to allow African Americans to go into the flight program, which is, you know, is Tuskegee Airmen. And they won their case. They said, well, we'll do this as an experiment, see what you guys can learn. And like you said before, we 
one mistake and you washed out the whole program. Whereas the white counterpart can do up six times that they learn, okay, over and over again, he can do what they were doing. And it turns out to be, as far as people saw in the movie, which is 80% true, 20% Hollywood, <laughs> the gentleman did pass the courses. Now, we've got to stay, stop right there. There were 15,000 men and women who went through the program, okay? There was 2,978 people who went to the pilot program. They washed out two-thirds of those programs with those people in that program. 992 became pilots. And 450 went overseas, 66 lost their lives, and 32 prisoners of war. Then that period of time, uh, from 1943 to 1945, they earned 864 medals. This is from Distinguished Flying Crosses all the way down to the Purple Hearts. And if you look at the, the way the gentlemen were treated, were talked about, said they weren't needed, they were praised for their work. See, they escorted bombers to 200 different missions, never lost a bomber in enemy aircraft for fire. They went through the number of 15,558 sorties, an airplane going from one place to combat and coming back, which amounted to uh, 1,578 sorties. Okay? Now, when you figure the young man is sitting in a cockpit even today and they all the instruments in the, in the P-51 and be 80 years old, with their brain smaller, larger, what you want to say behind that. But they were disciplined by Mr. Benjamin Davis. As was, was told before, he went to West Point four years, was never spoken to. The four times he was there, four years he was there, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. And he finished up the third of his class. Out of, was it 278 students, he was 35th from the top. Then he went on to be a disciplinarian in World War II. He guided his troops through the adverse periods of time, mechanics, armor people, doctors, lawyers, whatever you have, and liaison people in Italy, of all places. And you take that from education from smaller schools, smaller black schools, Knoxville College, Hampton Institute, Howard University, North Carolina, at and Central State, and Wilberforce, and a lot of people down that way. And as my dad would tell the stories about what was going on during that period of time, they could not go in town after they had liberty if they went in town, they were beaten by the local sheriff or the policeman in uniform. The MPs from the base had to go out and get them and bring them back to the bases to keep them away from the people in town. People thought their properties would go down because of the African American base right near their hometown. And they were, uh, like I say, just third class citizens. The story is told that when German prisoners of war came over here to be encamped, we took care of them, served them, everything like that. And when we got on trains, we were put in the last car. They said had the better seats in the, in, the, in the trains to go home. And one young man asked us, why could you serve a country like this? They did not want you in the first place. The young man replied, because I was born here. See, as all people should understand, when you were born in any country, even though they don't like you, do, what you do your duty, you can still perform and let it all go behind. We used to have a saying, from 8 to 4.30, I belong to the Air Force. All the time belongs to me. And you did your mission, you did your job, no problems, you know. And we had a lot of camaraderie. We always joke like and say we played cars or whatever and went around town. But the main thing about what we tell students is once you attain an education, no one can take that away from you, no matter who it is. And we promote education all the way through, you know, our speeches. And we enjoy telling the story about Tuskegee Airmen. Sure, they had all kinds of nicknames. If you remember some of the phrases, um, straight up and fly right, that came from Tuskegee Airmen. He's on down the road came from Tuskegee Airmen. And we like telling the stories about the guys going out in town, having a good time, and, and, and doing their job. And like a story was told about when the uh, bomber landed at uh, one of the, on Romantel Air Force Base, and the guys got stepped step on the plane two nights and froze. He realized he better go get the cop and go to sleep out next night. And in the movie, you see a, a section where a young man was uh, talking about how he knew people and what his dad and everybody was talking about until he got an airplane and flew with him. They kept, they saved us behind him every time. He said, and he, then by request, he would say, I want the Tuskegee Airmen to, to, to protect me going to the bomb, on the bombing run in to the target and, and back. But, you know, we don't stop there. Today, 
if you notice around, all your body has got a different background because of someone standing up for what they thought was right for their own constitution and their own bill of rights. If it hadn't been a few people stand up and get slapped around, whatever, talk about it, we wouldn't be here today telling you stories. I, I, in, in a sense, I was an aircraft controller. This is very unheard of back in the days when I went in the Air Force. But, you know, but it was attained. And my tech school was Biloxi, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Had a wonderful time there. Then I went to Alaska. Then I came back to the United States in a different Air Force place. I ended up at Wright Patterson in the Reserve Unit. Well, we, every place that we ever go, we always had fun. Always had fun because we were doing a, a said job. At any given time, we would crawl to war like it is now. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the war now. We would do our job because we were signed to that land to train to do that job. And I have a small background. It's, it's, it's nothing not long like Mr. McFeed is here, but I, you know, education was the main thing being taught. And we went to school. And once you, like I say, attain that again, you, you went a long way. But Air Force life is very enjoyable. Well, it's in good times and bad times, and we always got through the mission. That was our main course of, 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 the, uh, of the day. It's getting through that mission every different day. And I can tell you one particular Saturday afternoon in Puerto Rico, that Roosevelt Roads, where we fueled 86 airplanes in 45 minutes' time. It's a system called Hot Pits. If we come in the, in the airport, go to the Hot Pit area, and be loaded with airplanes, engines still running. They would load bombs on one side, we load their airplane fuel on the other side, and then they check off and go back to the next guy would come in line. This is like from A6s, A7s, helicopters, bombers, fighter planes, and what have you. When would this have been? Pardon? When was this, did you say? Uh, let's see, Roosevelt Rose was moving down there four different times. First time was 1989. Oh, wow. In 1987, we went to Keflavik, Iceland, and flew aboard P3 Orion aircraft and talk to the rest of the submariners over the North Atlantic, across the Arctic Circle. Mm. And went to Han, Germany, we went to uh, uh, okay, Skidstrip, Denmark. Lovely place. Mm. Denmark's the only place I really enjoyed getting fat because every meal they served potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a nice camaraderie with the, with the Denmark, with the Danes. Uh, they could not believe that we'd go through some things where we'd go with airplanes and make them fly like we did. But we did it. Mm. And so we did get, coming over our first week we were there, we come out watching what we were doing, see what they can make air for a little bit better. You felt good about someone asking yourself to do a particular job, he's got a higher rank than yourself, up to a general. I love telling this one story. In 1991, when Desert Storm kicked off the same Wednesday night, we were at Homestead Air Force Base, and seven stealth fighters came into the Air Force Base that afternoon. And we were refueling the airplane, I was sitting in the cockpit of that airplane, and watched the gauges, you know fulfill the, the, the assigned uh, duty. A two-star general came up to the airplane. He says, uh, I want to see that airplane. And the second lieutenant sent up with Uzi sitting around the airplane. He said, do you have a need to know, sir? He said, no, I don't, but I want to see the airplane. I'm a base commander. The young man said, I don't care who you are. You're not going to see the airplane. He said, who's that young man up in the airplane? He gave my name. He says, what is he doing? He said, I can't tell you what he's doing. <laughs> so when we got back to the base uh, fuel depot, he comes in, he, he, he was mad. <laughs> He said, where is that darn Sergeant Friendly? I said, here, sir. He said, what were you doing in the stealth airplane? I said, sir, do you have a need to know? He says, no, I don't want to know what you were doing. I said, no, sir, do you have a need to know? See, you get discipline from, from basic training to tech school to your assigned duty officer. If a, need, if a young man has a need, I had to go to the duty officer first, and they would come to you, and then ask you what your specific job was. And I said, sir, to tell you a little short story, I said, what were we doing at the present time? He said, you were, he said, if your truck was there, I said, yes. I said, give you a clue. I said, you were in the airplane doing what? I said, yeah, checking the gauges. He said, okay, now, you, you got the picture? He says, oh. And he went back and never heard more from it. <laughs> but it's things like that, you know, when we, you know, as reservists, we went to various Air Force bases around the world, and they learned from us because we had a discipline going that we learned the job correctly. You learned the Air Force manuals, tech orders, and wherever you would want to go, someone talk to you about what you were doing, you give a tech order number, a page number, and a sentence number. What's all this? Because you were taught that way. So I thank the gentleman like Mr. Peters and those before me who were disciplined enough to stay the course and not deviate from it and play around with it. Because once you played around, you go, you'll lose something. And in particular, another night in Puerto Rico, um, I found Bendor 37 sign F-4 airplane because I was bending over and someone called my name, I stood up. 
It's inside of a wheel well, and the bend door is right behind me. And that's no, no cutting back on these in need. Next day, you know what's going on. But we always had fun. We always wanted to help you up in Navy, Marines. Went to um, Cherry Point, North Carolina, and uh, showed the Marines how to do some things, and they taught us how to do some things. But it's always one and one. This United States is so diverse, and so many different backgrounds, that when you're born here, you don't carry another country's name before your own. You are an American. That's my speech. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what can I say but thank you? We really do appreciate your being here, and I have to add my own two cents worth, because I wrote it down that mm -hmm. I found it here. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to know that the Tuskegee Airmen flew over 15,000 sorties. Mm -hmm. They destroyed over 1,000 German aircraft during mm -hmm. World War II. They received more than 800 air medals and more than 150 distinguished flying crosses, and they never lost a ship that they, a uh, ship meaning a plane, mm -hmm. that they were protecting. Mm -hmm. And most of us hear about the red tails. Also in the other room across the hall, we have a Tuskegee Airmen video going so that you can go in and see it. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions, we'll try to answer them at this time. Don't all speak at once now. I had a you talked that you mentioned a movie. Uh, yes. You kept mentioning what the movie? Tuskegee Airman story by Lawrence Fishburne. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. that's very good. Mm -hmm. And we do have a gift for you, which I forgot. Uh -oh. Let me get. It. Doesn't take long. <laughs> Any other questions? Why was he getting it? Uh, yes. When the um, the Tuskegee Airmen were they incorporated within the Air Force or sort of defended as a separate? Uh, I, I, be, to answer that question correctly, in 1945, young, 1947, a young man by the name of Harry Truman brought about Executive Order 9981 and integrated all the Air Forces. And why that happened, if you've ever heard of looking back at Air Force Base, at one time it was locked one Air Force Base, it was the only African American base run for three years. And they would go to the different gunnery contests they would have after the war, and the guys would win. They were tired of getting the trophy, so we were to correct us a little bit, bring everybody <laughs> into in our service because hand in hand, they were touching, teaching other guys what was going on as far as the and gunner was concerned. Now I'd like to show you a demonstration. Back in the day, have you ever heard of, of a of a uh, maneuver called deflection air deflection shots? Two airplanes fight one another, weaving back and forth, weaving back and forth. And when, when the guy would turn over like this, another guy would fly up underneath him, he fired volley of shots that way, and the guy would fly into that. Tuskegee Airmen admitted that. Oh. And the move was a bit when he, even though I'm most saying you see a guy flying an airplane, shoot him down like that, and he goes down, or behind him shooting down. But the guys would get in combat, they'd be maneuvering back and forth to get away from the guy from behind him, and they would go up in the air like they'd be twisted around like this and go around like that. So the guy said, okay, you go that way, I'm going to fly that way. And he went that way, he got ran another volley of bullets. Down here we go. Yeah, is, is that the red tail? Model? This is the red tail here. Oh, okay. That's a B-51D model. This shows another P-51D model, but a different paint scheme. That's how they identified each other. The bomber pilots and the bomber crew would identify their own guys by different paint schemes. And this is, you can see that's very bright. So they knew who they were. And like some of the other movies would tell you, some other guys would fly with them, but once they see a German airplane, they I'm going after those guys. They would never come back and protect the bombers. And how, I'll show you the maneuver that was used for Mr. This the airplane here is Mr. Uh, Roscoe Brown's airplane. It's, it's, it's labeled wrong. On one side, it's called Bunny. That's his daughter. The other side should be Miss Kentucky State. Mm. He was from Kentucky. Uh -huh. And what happened? One of the German, just use this example, jet airplanes came through the formation. Roscoe saw me, but not like this. Uh -huh. And he shot him out that way. Mm. And the rocket planes would do. They would do one thing: fly straight up in the air. Go over the nose over and come down in formation. And when they would do, the guy would fly up and shoot a volley at the rocket planes and blow him up. And what was a synopsis about an ME-162 rocket plane, they were very, very volatile to the pilot. Because they weren't, the rocket fuel that was used in the airplane was not stable enough. When he fired anything by the airplane, it blow up. Any other questions? Yes. Are there any of the Tuskegee Airmen's P-51s in, in a museum anywhere in the country? Just the one. Is it, this, this airplane I was saying about, my, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Roscoe Brown's airplane, a replica of this is in Dolby, Delaware. The original was destroyed because of scrap in World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, two gentlemen from Minnesota, 
They had painted two P-51C P-51 model aircraft in Tuskegee's colors in there. And, you know, one was destroyed not too long ago when the pilot was killed, but they're restoring that aircraft on. So it's two really actually flying. Any other questions? Do you have any stories about your father's experiences? I mean, um, Dad, oh, he, 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 as far as Dad was concerned, he was like Mr. McFeeders. He got washed out of the program. He went to Battle of Bulge. He went on to Berlin as a foot soldier. That's what they would do. He was the second lieutenant. They washed him back to a private. He gained a corporal's status, Lance Corporal status, and he went to the Battle of Bulge and on to, on to Germany that way, into Berlin. And he tells a story about a, a tank battalion called 764 Tank Battalion. That was all black unit. And they were the ones who helped defeat the German Tiger tanks in the Battle of Bulge. And no one knows that story. Um, you, I believe, are an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Cincinnati Library. Have yes. you interviewed any of the surviving Tuskegee Airmen that escorted bombers in Europe for the Library of Congress project? Not as of yet. Uh, the Blue Ass Library called me three weeks ago. I haven't called back. I'm still going out there sometimes to do that, do that same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. There probably are some interviews in the website, aren't there? Or the yes. Our website. TuskegeeAirmanCincinnati.com has the number of bios of the people who are 11 bios and shown. Or you just put the person's picture name in and print you out a beautiful bio, all the bio for the person that was there. Okay. Yes, any more questions? What are the pictures that you have? Oh, because we don't have enough smaller spaces, let's just let's, let's tell some stories. This came from the Minnesota Museum of History. And they tell the stories. Is that the, the P-51 on the bottom of that, is that yeah. the B model? That's a C. C? Okay. Okay, this is Mr. Lee Archer. He's a young man that got taken out of uh, A-Staff because he didn't see his fifth plane shot down. He was in, in the video I have in there. His niece is in our chapter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can anyone tell me why that captain is there? If you ever experience any kind of combat whatsoever, and see some of the stories some of the gentlemen will tell you, they'd rather die than be injured. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why they say luck on his own die once. Mm -hmm. It's a direct shot through, you know, whatever. And it goes, like, you, see them, you go to a veteran hospital sometime. Oh, okay. Some of the kids that come back from Iraq, you, you'll see what, this, what that really means. Okay, the last one is. It tells a story. Uh -huh. But yet, uh, I'll use the captain, Mr. Um, C.I. Williams had told a student not too long ago at a Rebel Wright Elementary School in Dayton, Ohio. And student Barry Brody came up and he just said, Sir, well, why did you fight for a country like this one? You know, and all the adversities you had to go through that. And C.I. looked at him met right directly in his face and he was, C.I. is 90, almost 90 now. He said, because I was born in Lima, Ohio, and nowhere else, I know nothing else better than to serve my own country and, and keep my country safe. And that was his answer. <clears throat> Any more questions? Yes? A lot of historians believe that it's because of the fighting in World War II that paved the way for the Civil Rights Movement, that people saw the valor on the battlefield and it was, it was easier to accept the Civil Rights Movement. Do you find that to be a true statement? All right, yes. One of the things that was contributed to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, I was a friend of one of the black pioneers in aviation. His name was Chauncey Spencer. Mm -hmm. uh, Chauncey Spencer was influential in getting me with, appointed to a job at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Chauncey was from Lynchburg, Virginia, and. He and another uh, pilot, Dale Wright, uh, took a flight, an airplane flight from Chicago, intending to go to Washington. They ended up with engine trouble in a cornfield in Pennsylvania. Harrisburg. <laughs> the, uh, the information got back to Senator Harry Truman, and Senator Harry Truman called them to Washington to congratulate them on their effort 
and they told the story that heavily influenced Senator Truman, mm -hmm. and Senator Truman carried that with him for a long, long way. Yes. And we had a lot of uh, black pioneers in aviation. Uh, <coughs> Chauncey Spencer happened to be a, a mentor of mine, and uh, he's, he was influential in a lot of things in my life. Mm -hmm. Chauncey died in June three years ago. Uh, uh, we had uh, uh, those things that influenced the civil rights movement uh, were things that young people don't understand today. Uh, that civil rights movement was started by people who gathered together from all areas of the black community, from W.E.B. Du Bois to, uh, for his so-called talented tenth uh, ideas, to all the way, way before Martin Luther King. Uh, the Tuskegee Airmen were instrumental. This, this business that uh, Sam alluded to as far as the civil rights portion of our lives uh, really got its real emphasis, not just from the fact that we were so determined to uh, become recognized as Americans in America, but also it was, uh, it was something that the whole education process started beginning to be involved with. It still hasn't evolved enough in terms of what we see as an advantage for our young people. Uh, I preach every day in every way that I can that the textbooks in the schools are deficient in terms of credit to the black community for what we have done in the building of America. Mm -hmm. And our children have to endure that because they don't see us represented in those textbooks. Sure. And consequently, if they're not recognized, if they take a story to school, their peers, non-black, don't believe them and are subject to ridicule, and you've got conflict, mm -hmm. and you've got disrespect, and this is bad. Mm -hmm. We need a lot of things other than band-aids on our education process, mm -hmm. and we need more people to be involved. I used to be a Head Start director for New York City, and I found out the most effective way of affecting anything in the community for a child is with the parent. Mm -hmm. If you don't have parent involvement, mm -hmm. real involvement, yes. you don't have an effective program. All right. mm -hmm. And the child wears that for all of his or her life. Mm -hmm. And so if you can give a child a chance to be respected at home, mm -hmm. that respect is carried to school and the school will understand if the school has the textbooks and the teaching that will give them the balance that they need when they get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there any other questions? I heard once that the P-51 Mustang, if they held the trigger down, the burst of ammo would run out after 11 seconds. Yes. Is that true? That's true. So That's why they use they're short on. burst, short burst. Mm -hmm. Two, 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 with your finger. Yeah. You learn that. Because mm -hmm. you can see it's got like over 1,500 rounds. That can be gone. <laughs> and I think that had the longest range of any of the fighter planes, yes. and they had drop tags on them. So what would a standard mission be, like eight hours round trip? Eight, 12, 14. Wow. Whoa. So they had to really be careful with the up into Berlin was a, one way was nine and a half hours. Mm -hmm. to go to wow. Pulaski, Pulaski, the oil fields, it was like 11 hours, almost. And I, and I take it back, it was nine and a half hours to go there too also. Mm -hmm. That's your, that's your time. And most of the time, um, they said, what's 16 hours unless they stay in the cockpit, you know. They fly high mm -hmm. and come down to the IP point to meet the bombers and go in and go back up high and go back into it. 
Did you ever hear of any of the tricks they use to keep awake on such a long mission? Tell stories and jokes. <laughs> Just back and forth on the radio? Among themselves. On the, on a different frequency. And they would tell, they talk about one another. Like, you know, like the guys on the football team do, you know. Mm. Where, where, where did you go on a date last night? They just keep yourself together. They weed back, the weaving pattern we talk, we talk about, they would do that to get keep our minds focused. And then most of the time they came back at it with straight targets. Mm -hmm. Barges and you know, trucks and so forth. And I meant, failed to mention that two, one lieutenant and one captain had the distinction of sinking a destroyer with B-51 aircraft fire. Mm -hmm. No one else had ever done that either. And it's, it's to tell the story, they walked the bullets across the water into the powder magazine of the destroyer and blew it up. Did they have anything besides the machine guns, like rockets on the wings or something, or no, other weapons? No, they never did use those. Hmm. Absolutely. The other fire pilots that came out of uh, England, they would do all that stuff with machine gun fire. Hmm. They had a way of, you know, different ways of, you know, going weaving patterns and then to, to targets on the ground. Trains on bridges, um, barges, and convoys, in a way of taking them out. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the P-51 was the predominant fighter that the Tuskegee man used. There was no. The P-40 was the first. P-40 yeah, was, was it? Okay. And believe it or not, a lot of their aerial combat kills were in P-40s. Okay. And then he went to a P-39, which is a piece of junk. Everybody knew that. He went to P-47, and then he went to the 51s. Okay, so the 51s are probably the ones that got the most fame, but... Yes. Uh -huh. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. The P-40 was the main aircraft that was used to defend the landings at Anzio. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Germans uh, could not hold air superiority because of the skill of those pilots at that time. And that's an older aircraft, yeah, the P-40 at the time. Yes, that's it was slower. Well, now, what you could do in, in aerial combat, a slow airplane, you can drag a fast airplane down to your, your speed and you can defeat it. Right. The P-39, that was the, the, the Bell Air Cobra? The Bell Cobra. Mm -hmm. and the 47 with the Thunderbolts, those were right. amazing. Those were rugged airplanes. Yeah. But they had, uh, they were just, for, 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 bomb, for a bomb of course, they were a poor airplane. Right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Again, thank you. And, um, The Air Duke Crawford Museum is very proud of its World War II exhibit. We're also proud of these CDs that we have, and we'd like to give to each of you a complete set and hope that you will share them and spread the word about Air Duke Crawford as you go you. Thank around you the country. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to say that, uh, that people, everybody in the community should know about this museum. Mm -hmm. Uh, I found that uh, museums, when I visit a museum, it's what I call a joyful education. Mm -hmm. It's fun to learn, it's fun to know, it's yes. fun to realize. Mm -hmm. And you can, what you give of yourself, you can gain more from in a museum. Mm -hmm. A museum is a joy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the community should understand that it is a joy. It's fun yeah. mm -hmm. and it's educative and it's needed. Right. And you've helped us afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.